We are here tonight to study from the book of Acts, and so I would invite you to be turning in your Bible to Acts chapter 18. We'll be there in just a little bit, but I hope to see you when we all come together for worship this coming Sunday, either at 9 or 11, if at all possible, and I certainly hope you can be present for the class at 10 as well. And for our members, if you can use the Sign Up Genius account to sign up for one of the two worship services, we really appreciate that. And please remember, guests are always welcome. You do not need to sign up. Uh, we just want to see you there, and you are certainly welcome to do that. Uh, tonight, we are continuing our study of the book of Acts, the book of gospel action. It's written by Luke, the beloved physician, to a man by the name of Theophilus, giving him a history of the early church focusing primarily on the ministry of Peter and then also of Paul. And up to this point, we have looked at the first 17 chapters. So we have the ABCs of Acts. I know some of you may be joining us for the very first time tonight online. And so just running through that quickly, in case you're joining us on the phone, we have in chapter 1, the Ascension. Then in chapter 2, the beginning of the church, carried and cured, determined disciples, empty jail, first deacons with the question mark, Stephen, the great hero, the eunuch asking, how can I? I am Jesus, journey to Joppa, kingdom now includes Gentiles, Peter's liberated again, missionaries sent out with the first missionary journey. Uh, Paul and Barnabas had to convince the crowd they were not gods, but men. We had the reminder that the old law is not binding. The Philippian jailer converted in chapter 16. In chapter 17, we had questions answered in Athens with Paul preaching on the Areopagus as we studied last Wednesday evening. And tonight we're ready for Acts chapter 18. And the summary of Acts 18 is reasoning with a preacher. Although that's in the second half of the chapter, we'll save this for next week. But I'm just giving you a heads up here. Uh, chapter 18 is summarized by the phrase reasoning with a preacher. So tonight we move into Acts 18. Paul travels to Corinth, the city of Corinth, for the very first time. So this is the big picture, the entire second missionary journey. So we can kind of see where we are here. Get us, uh, Give us some perspective. And then I will zoom in on the western loop of this journey, the westernmost area that Paul goes from Philippi down to Thessalonica, then Berea, then Athens. And now tonight in chapter 18, he gets to the city of Corinth. I know it's not too clear on the map here, kind of artistically done. I wouldn't want to navigate by this map. <laughs> Uh, but Corinth was built on an isthmus. Corinth was built on an isthmus. Uh, this map, I think, is a lot clearer, a little bit at least. It zooms in on it. So of all people, of course, we here in Madison, we understand that an isthmus is a narrow strip of land between two bodies of water. And that is the case in Corinth. And like Madison, ancient Corinth was also built on an isthmus. In the upper left-hand corner, you can kind of see the expanded view of southern Greece. Uh, for many, many years, sailors would avoid the rough water south of Greece by unloading their ships, and they would put their cargo and their ships on ro log rollers, and then they would move everything across this isthmus. It was about four miles across at the narrowest point, and then they would all put it back in water on the other side. And as you can imagine, that was a royal hassle. This is <laughs> You don't want to have to do that. Um, as an east-west and north-south intersection, and with all of this sea traffic and commerce coming through this area, uh, we have many sailors passing through. We have a lot of people far away from home with no accountability. And I uh, hate to cut on sailors. I know some of you have been sailors in the past. It's an honorable profession and, and all that. Uh, but over time, with some serious negative immoral influences, Corinth came to be known as a very immoral city. And I don't know, if you were to ask today, what's the most immoral city in the United States? kind of hate to be judgmental. I've, I've got a few in mind. Um, I don't know. But, uh, New Orleans, perhaps. Las Vegas. Sin City. You know, that kind of thing. So it kind of had a reputation as being a very immoral city. As I understand it, every ancient play had a drunk from Corinth. Somewhere on the stage, if there was a drunk guy, he was known as the Corinthian. So it was a stereotype. It was intended to poke fun at the Corinthians, but it was pretty accurate. Uh, the city was, in fact, known for its immorality of all kinds. It's interesting to me to realize that the last half of Romans 1 was written by Paul to Rome, but Paul was in Corinth when he wrote that chapter. And in Romans 1, we have this huge list of terrible sins, and it's almost as if Paul is looking around him as he writes the second half of Romans chapter 1 from the city of Corinth. Uh, so that's the city, the church in Corinth as you can imagine, had some serious issues as well. And that's to say the least. Division, they were dividing up based on the most eloquent preacher. Uh, there was some 
incest between, uh, not between members, but at least one man was a member of the congregation, and it was accepted by the church. They were proud of it. Look how accepting we are. This guy is in a relationship with his uh, father's wife, his stepmother, and, and yeah, we're good with that because, you know, we're Corinthians. We're, we're, we're tolerant. Sound kind of familiar these days? Uh, they were suing each other in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. Their worship was disorderly and chaotic. You'd walk into their assembly, there'd be people yelling and jumping around all over the place doing everything, and nobody knew what was going on, and Paul had to correct that. Uh, some were perhaps even denying the resurrection. Well, that's kind of serious, isn't it? And we dealt with that in sermon form in that pretty long series of lessons a few months ago. We uh, worked our way through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So I'm just saying that the city of Corinth was very immoral, and on top of that, the church itself had some issues as well. Uh, anyway, after dragging ships and cargo over that four-mile-long isthmus for hundreds of years, I should point out they did finally dig a canal, and that was completed back in 1893, if I remember correctly. So now it's pretty much a tourist attraction. It's too, uh, too narrow, too shallow for most modern cargo ships, but back in 1893, this was, uh, this was huge. Uh, but it is pretty neat that they finally made a shortcut and kind of avoided um, all of that, uh, you know, going over the isthmus there. Well, tonight, Paul makes it to Corinth for the very first time. So we're going to pick up tonight with Acts 18. So join me, if you will, in Acts 18, verses 1, 2, and 3. Acts 18, verses 1 through 3. After these things, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them, and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. So, after baptizing just a few people up in Athens, really kind of not very successful of a trip, Paul makes his way down to Corinth. And once he gets to Corinth, he finds a Jewish couple, a man and a woman, by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. And these two are from Pontus, that's a region along the southern edge of the Black Sea, along the northern edge of what we would call Turkey today. Uh, they had been in Rome, so they've been traveling, but they had traveled back to Corinth due to Emperor Claudius and his decree that all of the Jews had to leave Rome. And we have a little bit of a secular history on that. It seems that the Jews were causing a disturbance with the Christians over a man named Crestus, C-H-R-E-S-T-U-S. That's the secular reference there. So in my opinion, they got it a little bit wrong, but the historian was saying, hey, there's a beef between the Jewish people over some guy named Crestus. And so Claudius kicked all the Jews out. We can't have that over here. We need law and order and so on. So that I'm just saying, if you want to look that up more on your own, we do have kind of a, a secular confirmation of Claudius and his decree to get all the Jews out of there. At the end of verse 2, into verse 3, we discover for the first time that Paul is a tent maker by trade. Uh, all Jewish fathers traditionally taught their sons a trade. I think the old saying was, if you don't teach your son a trade, you're teaching him to steal. That's a pretty good saying, isn't it? So, you're going to learn how to do hard work, and if you don't learn how to do something for a living, um, I'm raising you to be a thief. And so all Jewish fathers took that very seriously. So uh, Paul was a tin maker by trade. Uh, obviously, he was a scholar, but we also know Paul knew how to do stuff. He could work with his hands. He could make things. Aquila and Priscilla were also tent makers, so there'd be sewing involved, maybe tanning of hides, maybe weaving of you know goat hair or whatever they would make tents of out uh, make tents out of those days. And that's what these three have in common. Remember uh, a week or two ago, I talked about when people get together, they immediately form connections. Oh, yeah, you're also a tent maker. Oh, you're a tent maker. Well, let's get together and do things kind of thing. And so we find here they are working together as tent makers. Well, Paul jumps into secular work at this point. He makes tents or repairs tents. Certainly would have been a part of that. Uh, remember, there is no local congregation yet with the ability to support him here in Corinth. So he's now... Uh, hundreds of miles away from any potential supporting congregations back in Jerusalem or Antioch. And so Paul then, he works apparently full-time in Corinth as a tent maker. So let's continue then with Acts 18 verses 4 through 11. Acts 18 verses 4 through 11. And he was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks but when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, 
solemnly testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. Then he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. And the Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he settled there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. In verse 4, Paul continues his tradition of starting with the synagogues every Sabbath. So again, at this point, not during the weeks, but he's just doing this on the Sabbath. He would go there to try to persuade the Jews and those Greeks who were interested. Uh, remember, though, that by working as a tent maker, Paul would have been somewhat limited by that. He was not able to devote himself completely to the Word of God, working also as a tent maker. Uh, some of you know we regularly get a message through the church website from an accountant in Oklahoma. And um, this man preaches for a small congregation somewhere, somewhere in rural Oklahoma. And he's always thankful for the full text lessons that we put on our website. Uh, in the past, he said that it is so hard to work full time doing his regular 50, 60 hour weeks, but then to still have time to prepare a sermon each week. And so he said that uh, I use your material. And in my opinion, that is awesome. That's why we put it out there. And I know some of you who preach on a fill-in basis, you understand this. It is hard to prepare a lesson, especially when you're working 60, 70 hours a week. It is just uh, hard to get the time to do that. But I mention that because Paul was perhaps having similar struggles. Here he is working a good number of hours every week as a tent maker, but he's still somehow finding time to study and preach and uh, get that done on the Sabbath day. However, in verse 5, something interesting happens. When Silas and Timothy come down from Macedonia, when they show up, Paul suddenly just start, starts devoting himself completely to the Word. In other words, he transitions from part-time tent making and part-time preaching to devoting himself truly full-time to the Word of God. So what happened there? How was he able to do that? As I understand it, Silas and Timothy most likely brought some kind of financial support from the church in Philippi, allowing Paul to go back to full-time preaching and teaching. And this fits in with what Paul will write later to the church in Philippi over in Philippians 1, 3 through 5. He says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. And so it seems then that the church in Philippi helped Paul from the first day, from the beginning. Not from the beginning of his missionary journey. They couldn't have done that. They didn't exist yet. But from the beginning of the church in Philippi. So from the beginning of your congregation, right after I baptized Lydia and the Philippian jailer, you guys over there in Philippi were my financial supporters. You were my participation in the gospel. We are in this together. And in this passage, Silas and Timothy seem to be those who deliver the funds to Paul in Corinth. And that allows him, as I understand it, to stop tent making for at least a little while and to go back to full-time preaching. So he was willing to do whatever it took to get the job done. Uh, but certainly it was better if the Apostle Paul could go full-time you know, devoting his whole life uh, in a full-time way to preaching and teaching. Uh, by the way, I believe this is the last reference to Silas in the book of Acts. So Silas kind of disappears here. Just thought I'd kind of mention that. We are making some progress here. We're moving through the book. In verse 6, we have something of a familiar pattern, don't we? Ultimately, the Jews resist his message and they blaspheme. That is, they speak out evilly against Paul. I don't know if evilly is really a proper word there. Uh, they, they say bad things about Paul, so they're lying. They're getting people upset. So Paul then makes a public spectacle out of this. He shakes his garments, uh, making that statement about their blood being on their own heads, and then he announces he's going to the Gentiles. So it's almost like Jesus saying, you know, dust off the uh, dust off of your sandals kind of thing. Uh, but here, you know, a little bit of a different picture. And so he's going to go to the Gentiles. But where have we heard that blood on our own head statement before? 
We, we, it's several times in the Old Testament, but I think the most famous use of that concept comes during the trial of Jesus in Matthew 27, 24, and 25, when Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, His blood shall be on us and on our children. And so at that point, the Jewish people were accepting responsibility. We want Jesus dead. Crucify him. Pilate says, but he's innocent. And they basically replied, we don't care. Blame us. We will take full responsibility for that. And that is what Paul, I think, is reminding them of here. Now it is all on you. I've done my job. I have preached the gospel. Now it's your choice. And Paul is now backing away and going to the Gentiles, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Again, as he'll go on to mention in uh, Romans 1.16. From here, he sets up in the house of Titius Justus, right next door to the synagogue. And it's actually a little bit funny. Huge city of, uh, of Corinth, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And he doesn't go across town somewhere. But Paul, who was attracting quite a bit of attention as it is, leaves the synagogue and walks next door. Um, which again, that's just kind of hilarious to me. Uh, what a tactic. So in verse eight, uh, Crispus obeys the gospel. Uh, if the text simply tells us that Crispus believes in the Lord, how do I know he was baptized? Well, over in first Corinthians one, as Paul is condemning division in the church, a number of years later, he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now, I did baptize also the house of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized any other. But the point is, Crispus was baptized. To believe the Lord is to be baptized. If you believe, you will obey the gospel, all of it. Uh, many other Corinthians, when they heard, were also believing and being baptized as well. So an interesting kind of parallel there. Uh, notice how different this is from Athens. In Athens, the people were maybe kind of too smart to obey the gospel. Uh, they were too educated. To them, the gospel was foolishness, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 1. But the people of Corinth, even though they had a reputation for being sinful, they were obeying the gospel in large numbers. So they sinned, but they knew they were sinners, and they accepted the gospel for what it was. Uh, in verse 9, Jesus comes to Paul in the night by a vision, and based on what the Lord says here, what might we assume about Paul in Corinth? If the Lord has to come to me at night and tell me not to be afraid, there's a pretty good chance I'm afraid. Stop being afraid. That means I'm afraid. I think it's safe to read that into this passage. Paul was scared. Otherwise, the vision is pointless. He didn't need to appear in that way. And so Jesus then encourages Paul to keep on keeping on. And I think a lot of that probably goes back to how popular the gospel was becoming. Not just a little handful of people like up in Athens, but many people are being baptized. So Paul is starting to attract attention. And I think now he's thinking, I've come all the way around here in every city. People have tried to chase me down and tried to beat me up and treat me unfairly. And it's this is like going to be the grand finale. This is it. I'm going to die in Corinth. I'm just kind of reading that into this passage. But I think that's a pretty safe assumption based on the Lord's message. But one way the Lord encourages Paul to keep on keeping on is by reminding him, I have many people in this city. And I've thought about that a number of times through the years. God has people everywhere. Uh, as we travel, there have been situations where this has been so comforting. I might be a little bit concerned in some far off place in a foreign country, but God's people are everywhere. And God's people are almost always willing to help. If we reach out, uh, we have a lot in common. Uh, with this encouragement from the Lord, Paul settles in in Corinth. He digs in. He digs a trench. He gets going, uh, teaching and preaching for a year and a half. And during this time, Paul writes the books of First and Second Thessalonians. So he gets the report from Silas and Timothy, who bring the financial support down from Philippi. And when he gets that report, he writes a letter almost immediately back to Thessalonica. So that's First Thessalonians. And then a short time later, he writes a follow-up letter. And that would be the book of 2 Thessalonians. Concerning the, the timing of everything in Acts, I will uh, refer again to a study sheet on the major events in the life of Paul, first compiled by Dowell Flatt, uh, one of my professors at Fried Hardeman University. We called him Dr. Dewell. 
uh, Dowell Flat. I didn't call him Dr. Duell to his face, but a great, great Christian man, one of my professors. Uh, those upper-level Bible classes, highly educated man. This, this is one of the most helpful sheets of paper I have ever seen when it comes to understanding Acts, the life of Paul, and the dates and the circumstances of Paul's letters. I mean, if I had to save one piece of paper for my whole office, th this would be in the top five. Uh, just an amazing resource here. I'll try to get this to you. I can't guarantee it with me being out of town. I'll try to get it to you by email. Uh, or on the website, or maybe the description in the video, I don't know. But this this is the chronology of Paul's life. And it outlines the dates of his travels, and the places, and the dates of all of his letters. Uh, I would encourage you to keep a copy in your Bibles, or digitally. Um, for years, I was dealing with a copy of a copy of a copy. And the, and the first copy was, Brother Flat put it on legal-sized paper. Well, Thanks a lot, because, you know, that doesn't fit anywhere, does it? I kind of hate legal size paper. I'm not a lawyer. What do I need legal size paper for? So anyway, so I had it reduced, and then I had copies of copies, and it was getting kind of messed up. And so a few years ago, I just completely reformatted this, being very careful to maintain the tabs and the formatting in a way to make it easy to understand. Um, I don't know if you can see this on your screen, but there there are some... Uh, offsets here and that that's for a reason if you know what you're looking for the, and you get more and more familiar with this sheet it just gets more and more helpful through the years um, and you guys helped with some proofreading of this if you find more errors or little issues let me know and I'd be glad to go back and make some more corrections but I know some of you made some very good catches with this a few years ago uh, brother flat was a good man he suffered with depression for his whole life until depression finally took his life as I understand it but he was a huge encouragement to me personally, one of the big reasons why I ended up going to Freed Hardeman. As some of you know, I just put Freed Hardeman on my ACT as a possibility. I didn't know if I wanted to go into preaching or photojournalism. And uh, Brother Flat was the first to call me. I got a, Not long after I took the ACT, he called me one night during the first semester of my senior year in high school. Um, he was from Detroit, and uh, he was a sports guy, and he just called and said, Hey, how are the Chicago Bears doing these days? Well, you guys know, I don't care. I don't care about the Bears. I don't care about sports. And so, but you know, that was how we opened it up, looking for things we have in common, right? That was, this guy's from Chicago. I'm from Detroit. How the Bears doing? So he, he got that conversation off the ground in a good way. And we talked and he talked to me about coming to Freed as a Bible major. And I said, I'm a little concerned about the finances. I just don't know if we can make that happen. And I remember Brother Flat said, if you decide to come here, I will make it happen. And he did. He personally arranged a very helpful scholarship. And uh, this is the man who originally compiled the information on this worksheet. So I've included uh, his picture in the lower right-hand corner. He did not put his own picture on his own worksheet. I did that uh, to honor him in some way. So again, I'll try to get this to you, and I hope it's helpful, especially as we go through the book of Acts. So let's continue with Acts 18, verses 12 through 17. Acts 18, 12 through 17. But while Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him before the judgment seat, saying, This man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or a vicious crime, O Jews, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you. But if there are questions about words and names and your own law, Look after it yourselves. I am unwilling to be a judge of these matters. And he drove them away from the judgment seat. And they all took hold of Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and began beating him in front of the judgment seat. But Gallio was not concerned about any of these things. <laughs> First of all, just a quick note on the timeline. Uh, we have a secular inscription concerning the rule of Gallio, uh, allowing us to, to kind of link the timeline of the book of Acts to the timeline of secular history. So based on this, we can date Paul's arrival in Corinth to the beginning of the year 50 AD with a fairly high level of confidence. So we can then go back and then we can go forward in time and date to kind of uh, date the other events in the book of Acts as well, both before and after this. So this mention of Gallio is pretty significant. Luke puts this in here. He is a, he is an historian. And so just for that reason, reminds us that this is not a fairy tale of some kind. This is not made up, but we actually have, you know, a plaque with this guy's name on it kind of thing. Uh, Acts is a book of history. Uh, beyond this, this is a kind of weird account, isn't it? I had to read this over and over. If I understand this correctly, the Jews, once again, start harassing Paul. 
they're getting good at it. This is their thing, they know. Uh, only this time they take him to the local proconsul, so some kind of local leader, perhaps appointed by the Romans, and their charge is this man persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. As Paul is about to make a defense, like Paul's opening his mouth, and at that point he is interrupted by the local proconsul. And if I could summarize this Roman official, who cares? This is not my problem. In fact, the proconsul seems more than slightly irritated. <laughs> Uh, and it almost seems like there's a history here. Here we go again, kind of attitude. What is it with you people, kind of speaking to the Jews? So this judge, this proconsul, seems a bit exasperated with the Jews, uh, but ultimately he doesn't care. And he turns his back on this. He just kind of backs away slowly. Not my problem. You people deal with this, so this is not my issue. And uh, this, some have suggested, kind of really opens the door for Paul to preach throughout the Roman Empire. At this point, the official position of the empire is, we don't care what you people do. We don't care what you teach and preach. This is not our problem at this point, at least early in 50 AD. Uh, in response, it, it looks to me as if the locals grab Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and they beat him right there in open court. And what impresses me is Gallio doesn't care. Gallio almost seems to approve of this. He's in charge and he doesn't stop it when he has the power to do so. In his view, Sosthenes had it coming by taking up his time and the time of the court over some completely insignificant little religious matter. Uh, in my mind, I'm trying to imagine this from Paul's point of view. He gets hauled into court. There's this serious accusation. He's about to open his mouth to make his defense. The judge interrupts by calling the charges stupid the crowd beats the accuser, the prosecutor, right there in open court. The judge doesn't care. Case dismissed. Uh, remember what we just read about the vision. The Lord told Paul, Do not be afraid, for I have many people in this city. Some of those people perhaps just now took care of business right there in open court. And God protected Paul through all of this. Uh, but that's not all. Do you remember how Paul starts his first letter back to the church in Corinth? He starts by saying this, Paul, called as an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth. And then he goes on from there. It's not a rock-solid case, but it seems to me as if Sosthenes is eventually converted and joins Paul on future journeys. And so when Paul writes back to Corinth, the book of Corinthians is actually not just from Paul, it's from Paul and Sosthenes. And he starts it like this because Sosthenes was once one of them. It's almost like saying, hello, Paul here, I'm writing you a letter. And Sosthenes told me to tell you hi as well. So let's continue then with Acts 18, 18 through 22. Acts 18, 18 through 22. Paul, having remained many days longer, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. In Sincrea he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. They came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a little longer time, he did not consent. But taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and went down to Antioch. Well, eventually Paul leaves Corinth, taking along Priscilla and Aquila. Notice Priscilla's name is first here, which is a little bit unusual. Um, some have taken this as Priscilla perhaps being the more spiritually mature of the two. And I think we've known those situations today. It's not a bad thing. It's just the way it is. Um, sometimes there'll be a wife who is more spiritually mature. Maybe she's been a Christian longer than her husband. And she may know more about the Bible. Maybe this woman was a little bit closer with Paul. Maybe, I don't know. But uh, her name is given first a number of times in Scripture. Um, they leave. They head towards Syria. Not before Paul stops in Sincrea to get his hair cut. He was keeping a vow. Uh, it seems to perhaps be the tail end of a Nazarite vow. During that vow, uh, you couldn't cut your hair. You couldn't do a number of other things. Uh, but once that vow had been completed, you could then cut your hair again. So we're not told. We're kind of short on details here. Um, it might have been this, might have been something similar to this. We don't know. Kind of like fasting. It's 
one of those things where it's kind of not, we don't have a lot of information about it in the New Testament. Um, Sincrea is basically a suburb of Corinth, so we didn't get too far out of Corinth before he cut his hair and did the whole vow thing. It's about five miles to the southeast. So Sincrea was to Corinth what McFarland is to Madison, okay, a smaller village several miles to the southeast. In verse 19, on his way back to Syria, Paul drops off Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. He's in Ephesus just for a very short time. They want him to stay longer. Uh, he says, oh, you know, he promises to come back for a longer visit if God wills. Um, I will return, he says. Um, General Douglas MacArthur was not the first to say, I shall return. And uh, I'll be back did not originate with Arnold Schwarzenegger in the Terminator movies, but uh, it came from Paul, didn't it? I will return. So Paul promises to come back. He leaves Ephesus in verse 22. He lands at Caesarea. He goes up to greet the church, probably a reference to elevation going up to Jerusalem. And then he goes back down to Antioch. All of this up and down again with reference to elevation. He comes in at sea level at Caesarea goes up in the hills to Jerusalem, most likely, and then he goes back down to Antioch, even though Antioch is way up north of Jerusalem. So this brings us to the end of the second missionary journey. So that's where we wrap it up tonight. By way of review, on the second missionary journey, Paul and his team were able to encourage and strengthen the churches he established on the first missionary journey, with Paul and Silas visiting Lystra and Derby, and Barnabas heading to Crete with John Mark. So they covered twice the territory, half the time or whatever. Um, then we've seen Paul train two new missionaries, Timothy and Luke. We've also seen the gospel make it to Europe. That's a huge thing that happened on the second missionary journey. Uh, churches being established as the gospel is preached in Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, Sincrea, and Ephesus, at least on a very brief visit with a promise of a longer return or longer visit in the future. So next week, uh, we get to Paul's third missionary journey, Lord willing. Tonight, though, we've seen questions answered in Athens. The philosophers wanted to know more about the Christian faith. Paul answers their questions. And this week, we've moved over into the beginning of the church in Corinth. So these things, he's just moving around the uh, the, the seacoast there. Uh, thank you for taking the time to study together tonight. I hope you can be present for worship on Sunday at 9 or 11 and join us for class in between at 10. This would be a good time to sign up and let me know if there's anything we need to put in the bulletin. Uh, let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you are the one and only awesome God, the God who appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus and the God who is with us today as we share the gospel with those we know and love. Tonight, we're thankful for Paul's courage in preaching the good news and we pray that we might have the same ability to keep on keeping on. We're thankful tonight for those who first taught us the gospel, for our parents, perhaps a neighbor or a friend, maybe even a stranger, and we pray that we might have the wisdom and courage to do the same for someone else as was done for us. Thank you, Father, for saving us, and thank you for making us a part of your plan to preach your word to the whole world. In Jesus we pray. Amen.